Hi, Miss Wendy. Um, I always, so I preach to the students every week, and I preach to you guys a couple times a year. I don't know if I'm ever not going to be nervous walking up. I feel like that's a good thing, considering I'm someone who doesn't get nervous that often. Um, but sometimes I forget to breathe, so when I get up here, I'm like, so anyway, hello everyone, it's so good to see you. I'm very excited to be back with you in this capacity of being able to preach the word. Um, I'm a big fan of the Old Testament. Every time I've preached, I, I don't know if you've noticed, I've preached from the Old Testament. Leah, why do you love that so much? It's all stories. Like, we get to actually learn about people who are just like us. There's really no difference. So it's like we can see ourselves in the, in the shoes of Moses. We can see ourselves in the shoes of Ruth. We can see ourselves in these characters because they're just like us. How do you preach about the Messiah of the world and go, me too? You can't. I don't want you to be bummed out, but that's impossible. Um, but I'm very excited for today because it is a story of redemption. I feel like redemption is something that we say in the church a lot because it really, literally the original definition is the saving from our sins and evil literally coming from God. It's not just a secular word we use. It's very, very much a Christianese word that has seeped into secular culture. But Peter probably has the best redemption arc of the entire Bible. And we really don't talk about it all that often because Peter is the rock, right? That's what we always talk about. Peter was told, it is you I will build my church on. So we're like, all right. So Peter's the man. When we look at the 12, we're like, number one. But we also see Peter in the most human moment. I'm using the, the example of Matthew because I feel like Matthew gives us very specific I don't know, bummer words when it comes to the best part of it. We'll be reading from John, but specifically in Matthew, we see Peter outright afraid to claim Jesus as a friend. Not as his Messiah, not as like his brother, but literally at the bare minimum, a friend or acquaintance. He's asked by three people in the book of Matthew, two slave women and then a gaggle of humans that come to him. So the first servant that comes to him says, oh my gosh, you know Jesus, right? His words are, I don't know what you're talking about. If you were to hear that a friend was walking around and someone went, oh my gosh, do you know Miss Shirley? And they go, what? No, who's that? I don't know about you, that would hurt my feelings. Okay, mean. But then another servant girl comes up to him and goes, you are one of that man's disciples. Not just a friend, not just a good buddy. You follow this man and take cues from him and learn from him. I do not know this man. Doesn't just say again, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Outright says, I do not know this man. Finally, bystanders. So we're talking at least five, right? Probably more. He's in the temple courts. There's probably a bunch of people out there. There's a little bit of a crucifixion going on behind them. So there's a couple people around, you know? And they say, you are one of those men that follows Jesus. He began to curse and swore an oath. I do not know that man. Bummer. I don't know about you, that kind of bums me out. Makes me a little sad. Because I'm sitting here going, and cue the rooster. Jesus called it. And Peter was like, you're crazy, man. I would never do that. He just did it in a matter of seconds. Back to back to back, no. And it got worse. It didn't just go, no, 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 no way. No way on God's green earth do I know that man. He doubled, tripled down. So then, of course, we have the beautiful resurrection of Jesus that we celebrated two weeks ago. Woo! But now we're moving into Jesus has 40 days on earth before he ascends. We know this. The disciples are still figuring out, okay, you're real. You're actually sitting with us. 
One of my favorite examples of Jesus proving that he's alive and he's back from the dead is he talks about how hungry he is. Because when I wake up from a nap, I too want to remind people that I'm alive from the dead by eating. (laughs) In that way, we're like twins. But anyways, so now we are seeing an example of Jesus eating with his disciples once again. Something he's always done. But this is one of those examples of the miracle of the fish. That's where we're starting in our passage. So I'm just going to break it down for us. Um, Basically, Jesus walks out to the water. There are seven disciples in a boat offshore, and he goes, have you caught any fish? And they don't know who it is. It's too far out. And they're like, no. He goes, I triple dog dare you to throw the net on the right side of your boat. And they're like, triple dog, boom, 153 fish, plenty of fish to go around. They pull, they're starting to pull the net in, and all of a sudden, one of the disciples says, it's Jesus. Peter turns, jumps in the water, swims to shore. The rest of the disciples are like, I guess we'll just pull this in by ourselves. You know what? We're not even going to pull it into the boat. We'll drag it behind us. I love this imagery for a couple of reasons. I love the fact that Peter's just like throwing himself into the water, like, I'm ready. But then the disciples are like, I trust this net to carry 153 fish. These nets took weeks to make, and they were like, we're going to chance it. We're going to hope that we are able to hold on to this many fish, because this is not just going to feed their families. It's going to go to the market and bring in money for their families. They're like, if we lose it, we lose it, whatever. And then if they lose the net, now they have to remake it, which can cause a huge delay in fishing, which causes a delay in eating and making money. It's a whole shebang, you know? But Peter doesn't hesitate. He jumps in the water. They get to shore, and he goes, Jesus goes, hey, guys, so good to see you. Do you smell the beautiful array of breakfast I'm making you right now? He already has fish on a grill. He has bread prepared for them, and he says, let's have breakfast. So they're getting ready, and then he goes, actually, how many fish did you get? And they pull the fish out of water, and that's when they count 153, and the net didn't break. I love the miracle of the fact that we have 153 fish, and that the author thought it was so important for us to know 153. That doesn't have biblical significance. It's just a fancy number. To me, the net didn't break. They didn't have doubts. They just pulled it along behind them as they are paddling as hard as they can to get to shore. So that is the confidence that we're entering our text in today. They trusted not only that Jesus would provide fish, but that their nets would be protected to bring those fish in. And Jesus has breakfast ready. The best. So I would hate for us to forget that with Peter jumping into the water, we see biblical cleansing for Peter. Water is always imagery towards cleansing. So before Peter gets out of the water to greet Jesus for breakfast, he has cleansed himself to enter the presence of Jesus. He is ready. He not only got in the water and like doggy paddled, he swam out there. He is dripping wet. He went head under, his hair is all wet, He's a mess, but he needed to get to Jesus, and he was clean. So now, thank you, Charlie, you were super ahead of it. We're going to head into our passage today, which I messed up. I said John 10. It's actually John 9, but that's okay. So chapter 21, verses 9 through 17, this is what our gospel tells us. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire here with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had risen from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And then he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Bow in a word of prayer with me. Gracious and holy God, thank you for redemption. Thank you for cleansing. God, thank you for your presence. I pray that as we read your son redeeming one that we thought never needed redeeming, we are reminded of how gracious you are. Speak through me and may my words be a form of worship to you. Amen. So we're kind of working off of three things here. This isn't the first time Jesus has had a meal with them and they still don't automatically recognize him. So we can tell that it's still settling in them. We watch this man die and he's actually risen from the dead. It's not a distrust, but it's kind of one of those, oh, you've performed miracles, but this is different. They could feel it and they could see it. So they trust their intuition and they trust that this is their Lord. Then the second thing we see is Jesus helped them catch fish and keeps their nets secure, as well as not asking them to use any of those fish for their breakfast. He already has breakfast and fish and bread prepared for them when they come ashore. They don't have to wait. They don't have to clean the fish. They don't have to start making the bread. Jesus has it already prepared for them. Have you ever walked into a house that the cooking's already started and you show up and you can just smell it? And they're like, two more minutes, go ahead and sit down and I'll start serving. That is such a crazy feeling because you're like, wait a second, I should be doing, I should earn this. I shouldn't be receiving such hospitality for just showing up. And Jesus says, that's exactly how I need you to show up. That's exactly what I need you to do when you come into my presence. And then number three, we see that Jesus feeds them, chats and fellowships with them, and now needs to share redemption with them. Because something about redemption that I always love is that you're not just forgiving the person in front of you or that person's not just receiving redemption, it's a ripple effect. Because if Peter wasn't redeemed, what kind of confidence would he have walked out to make disciples of all nations with? What would he, would he feel like he has something that he, he doesn't quite connect with people because well, if I couldn't stand by a friend at their worst moment when they promised they would come for me, how could I stand with someone who's asking so little of me? There's always a form of self-doubt when you have something lingering between a friendship or between a community. So by Jesus redeeming Peter, it is now redeeming thousands. They are receiving the full gospel, not just a part of the gospel. We get to see redemption not just once, not just twice, but three times. After breakfast, Jesus gets down to business. He goes, we have full tummies, full hearts, can't lose. You ready? Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? There are arguments between scholars as to what these are. It could be a couple of things. Do you love me more than these people love me? Do you love me more than the fish, the nets, the boat? We don't really know, but I think the bottom line is Jesus is truly asking me, asking me, <laughs> ooh, that was deep. Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me more than anything? And Peter, I kind of love this because this is exactly how I would react if I felt like I needed to be a little defensive with someone. Jesus does, or Peter doesn't answer with like, of course. He says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. It's kind of a snarky response, 
right? As someone who is a child of a parent, I would like to say, I've said this many times, what are you, of course I know what I'm doing. I don't need your help. And my mom would always be like, okay, have fun. And I wouldn't have fun. You know, the, the snarky response from Peter is very much, it feels like a teenager's defensiveness of, I didn't do anything wrong, but there is glass in the kitchen, so please don't go in there. You know what I mean? Saying, you know I love you. But nonetheless, Jesus says, feed my lambs. A.K.A lead and make disciples. He's reinstating him into the further narrative. He's saying, all right, you say you love me. Go and do so. And again, Jesus asks for a second time. He said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter again says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I'm like, all right, hands are still up. We haven't called a bluff yet. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. Now's my favorite part of my sermon. I'm going to talk about my dog named Hank. (laughs) So for those of you who don't know, I have a beautiful golden doodle. I was going to put a picture up. I thought that was a little far. But anyway, Hank is amazing. We live in an apartment, which can mean a lot of things. First of all, he's in the way constantly. But second of all, when he needs to go to the bathroom, I have to take him outside. Can you imagine on days like this? The worst. Anyways, but here's the thing. If I were to just feed Hank, have food out for him, have water out for him, and nothing else, I didn't do anything else, just fed him, I would be a neglectful owner, correct? I mean, if you were to walk into my apartment and you notice there's food for the dog, but then you notice a couple other things in the apartment that aren't supposed to be there, you would be like, what is going on? Like, is this dog okay? Is Leah okay, you know? But I would be considered a neglectful owner for only caring for one portion of my dog, his food needs. But when it comes to animals, especially with Hank, there's a couple other things. He needs to go for walks, because he has a lot of energy, and he has to go to the bathroom. He needs to be brushed because he has curly hair, and if he gets matted, he gets very uncomfortable, and then it's just like, you know, just not a great life. And I need to play with him because he needs to know that I care about him, and I get to interact with him and stimulate and have fun. These are all under the umbrella of tending to my dog. So the unspoken but vital moment for a healthy dog is doing all of these things. Sheep are a little different, but not by much. When you feed a sheep, great, they're fed. But they have to get sheared. They have to go through a meadow, and they have to graze. They have to be protected from wolves and lions and bears. Oh, my. They have to be tended to. So Jesus doesn't just keep saying, feed my sheep, over and over and over again. He uses this defensiveness of Peter to say, here's the rest of your to-do list feed my lambs, and now he's saying, tend to my sheep. Jesus is reminding Peter to care for the whole person, not just the specific need that you can see on the outside. So when we see a lot of miracles that Jesus performs, it's not just that Jesus heals the crippled so that they can walk, or heals the bleeding woman so that she no longer has health concerns. He heals their social standing, They are now able to re-enter society. He heals a part of them that other people couldn't see or care about. Then we enter the last moment of redemption. Jesus says to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, like I said with other things, we're so used to this sassy response of, you know I love you, calm down, like I love you, Jesus de- or Peter's defensiveness. But we see the reality of what Peter is feeling as Jesus is asking very blatant questions. He's not just saying, how do you feel about me, and leaving it open-ended. It's a very pointed question. Do you love me? So now we get to see into Peter's psyche. Peter felt hurt because for the third time Jesus asked, do you love me? (sighs) 
because now Peter is having to acknowledge inside of him, I not only said no three times to absolute strangers, but you know that I denied you. So I imagine Peter kind of sitting there for a second and having to sit in this feeling for a second. That just a few days or weeks ago, he denied Jesus as Jesus hung on a cross dying and he lost hope and trust in what Jesus had taught and promised. But we are watching in real time as Peter is being redeemed of his doubts, being redeemed of his mistrust, being redeemed of his fear. And Peter replies, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus replies with such a simple phrase of feed my sheep. Not only is Peter forgiven and redeemed, being saved from evil and error, we are seeing this friendship and this mentorship redeemed. The first two questions in Greek use the word agape for love. And that is the greatest form of love. Do you love me? We always talk about God's agape love because we're trying to express how big God's love is for people and for the world. But in the last question, Jesus used filio, which is the love between friends. Jesus asks his third and final question saying, do you love me, your friend, your mentor, your companion, do you love me? I think each of us have had a moment in life where we've asked someone this, or we've thought about it and gone, do you love me for me? And that is what Jesus is asking Peter. Okay, you love me because I am Lord. You love me because I'm the Messiah, but do you love me as your friend? Jesus reminds us that when we see feed my lambs, Lambs are babies. They're not full-grown sheep. Are you caring for the, kids, the ones that I love the most? The children. Are you feeding them and preparing them for life? Then take care of my sheep. Don't just acknowledge that they're in the fields and they're out there and they have needs. Care for my people. And then lastly, feed my sheep. I like that we talk about feeding children first because we have to teach them, right? They don't know how to do things automatically. Most of the time they have to be taught how to do things if it's not instinctual. So you start by feeding them. But with adults, he starts by saying, take care of them, Peter. Take care of my people. And then he says, and then feed them. Prepare them for me. I love this story because it is my relationship with Jesus. I love this story because a couple of weeks ago, what inspired this passage is one of my favorite pastors who's in Queens, New York. His name is Rich Volodos, Volodoza. He says, Jesus asks, asks Peter three times if he loves him. One of the most beautiful acts of redemption. These three questions cancel out Peter's three denials as we've discussed. But during Eastertide, which is also for us Pentecost, the time between the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus, we are invited to confess our love for Jesus. Sounds like the bare minimum, I know. But think about it. Rich says, like Peter, I have denied Jesus plenty of times, in word and in deed. I've distanced myself from his love and his teaching. I have denied him through prayerlessness, apathy for the poor, and clinging to the words of those instead of his. I am filled with contradictions. But the resurrection of Jesus comes and invites me to confess once again this love I have for my Savior. Jesus doesn't need me to confess my love to him because it was never asked for the way it was for Peter. But in asking the questions myself, I confess to him once again, 
the way he offers me to live a self-confident life free of condemnation and self-hatred. I think that is something that we breeze over a lot as we talk about Jesus loves me and that's all I need. Because that's easier to scratch the surface than it is to dig deeper. If we just keep dusting off the top of the box, it'll be fine. Even though the box is full of junk and we don't actually need any of that junk and it would be better if we emptied the box, but we dusted the top of it. So I like myself. Instead of digging deeper and saying, I have denied Jesus. I have forgotten my call in life. I have forgotten how deeply loved I am by my creator. Redemption affects more than just us inside. It doesn't just heal our relationship with Jesus, it heals our relationship with others. Because when we are reminded of how loved we are by our creator, who knows everything, even parts that we don't like to talk about or acknowledge, Jesus still chooses us. What I said at the beginning of like, it's hard to preach the gospel because we can't always compare ourselves to Jesus because he's Jesus. We can compare ourselves to Peter. Peter is probably one of the most talked about of the 12 disciples. He is the person that everyone's like, oh yeah, there are those gospels. And then isn't there a guy named Peter? It's also one of the most common names in the world. Shout out to Pete Ackman. Anyways, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was for you. But at the end of the day, here is a man who was vital to the dissemination of Jesus' message. And Jesus said, you came to me cleansed. You cleaned yourself before entering my presence. Now go. Go out, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. You are ready. It doesn't, that's how, it, it, then we talk about how Peter's going to die, which is a super bummer, so I was like, we're not going to talk about that part. But I can't imagine walking, how Peter felt walking out of this breakfast, outside of being sopping wet. He walked out with one of two feelings, conflicted, like, do I deserve this? Do I not? Not going to lie, that's probably how I would feel. Or he walked out with a confidence of going, we did it. Everything is as it should be. I would love to say I flopped on that side and went, yes. But the reality is, this love can be so unfathomable. This redemption sounds borderline ridiculous. If a friend denied me three times and said, no way, I would be deeply hurt. But Jesus said, because I don't love like that, I forgive you. My love is greater than yours. Oh, fine, I guess I accept your gift. I want us to go into this week thinking about how are we feeding and tending to God's sheep. Are we doing the bare minimum and feeding them and just giving them what they need, bare minimum? Or are we caring for them as a whole? and looking into who they are and going, this person needs more grace this week. This person needs compassion this week. This person just needs someone to be with them this week. I want us to think of ourselves and the love Jesus has for each of us. I want you to ask yourself, are you feeding yourself this week? Are you tending to yourself this week? Because Jesus doesn't see it as you now have to go out and do it. The expectation is because you're already doing it, it comes naturally. Let's enter a time of silent meditation.
gracious and holy God. The Redeemer who lives and loves us so deeply. God, may we go out and do as you commanded Peter. And God, as we go out, we will, may we remember to care for what is within us. That you don't just love us as missionaries to go out and care for others, but you love us as individuals standing before you, bearing our souls. Bless the rest of this week, and may we be good sheep in return. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us as we have our clear.